and welcome to the Everyday Board Game Podcast with your hosts, Daniel. And Daniel. We're getting more animated now. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. You got rid of the creepy voice, thank God. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd change it up a little bit. I'll, don't worry, that'll return next week. So we want to give a big shout out real quick. Daniel, this is a very important top eight debate for us. Why it really is, is. And that's because we are calling this the championship edition. This is our one year anniversary. We've been doing this podcast because the start of lockdown, it's the one year anniversary of that as well. So uh, it's important for us to at least acknowledge where we started from very beginning to now. And so we have some really good games in this bracket mind you for once we didn't get these off board game geek these are specifically our winners of our podcast and this is also the first one where we didn't allow honorable mentions from our viewers sorry about that but really specifically the reason we did that is on the poll on board game revolution we wanted to highlight these eight Eight games. games there's a very strong reason for that also, I got to make mention of the fact that even though it's our top eight debate and you're going to wonder about the seedings because we usually get it a lot from Board Game Geek uh, where their rankings are in the poll, we did something a little different on this one and we got to make sure we tell you how it worked. So, whoever had the most wins got bumped into it no matter what. Even if it was a game that's ranked 1001, if it got the most wins, it would have been our number one seed. Yep. Just because yep. we had to acknowledge what it's done for us as we were going through. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we did. So I have some stats we'll talk about in a little bit. But six games won multiple times. And then they'll fill the last two spots. We had a pool of, what was a 26 or no, no, uh, 23 different games. That's where the BGG ranking came in. And there were some games that got knocked out because of that. Right, which really wouldn't have normally. But, I mean, yeah. that, that, you know what? Before we keep belaboring it, let's talk about these top eight. And let's tell them what they are because that'll make sense for the comments down below. So we right. have our number one seed. Take it away. Gloomhaven. And the thing about Gloomhaven, it had three wins. It won the campaign, the crowdfunded, and series top eight debate. And that will be facing off against our number eight seed, saddens me to say, Castles of Burgundy. Which only had one win, and that was the Stefan Feld game. So that was more recent. Uh, That's right. Then we have our number two seed, the Quacks of Quedlinburg. Which had three wins, deck, bag, pool building, push your luck, and medieval games. Yep. Versus our number seven seed, surprisingly... Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Which only had one win as well, and that was Action Points. Again, another one that was most recent. Yeah. Uh, Our number three seed, Horrified. Which is the last of our three game winners, and there is a caveat for this, which I'll explain in a minute. It won the IP Movies. And then for its second win, it won IP overall, which means it after, because we did two IPs. We did IP movies, IP novels. It went against the, the champion of IP novels, which was Lord of the Rings Journeys to Middle Earth, and ended up winning that one. And finally, Prospero Hall. Yep. And our number four, I'm sorry, that is facing off against our number six seed, Space Base. Which actually had two wins. AEG games, and more recently, Dice Games. And our number four seed, Seven Wonders Duel. Which also had two wins. It won two-player only in Repo Productions. And that'll be facing off against our number five seed, Mansions of Madness. The last one with two wins, it won Fantasy Flight Games and Horror Games. There we go. This is a big-time debate. This is going to be a difficult one. But let's, we asked our audience to take a vote for this. Uh, uh, before we get yeah. going, I do have some stats overall for all of this. Yeah. There was 35 and a half top eight debates since March 27, 2020. The half being the IP one that I was talking about. There's been 25 different winners of our top eight debate. Three games had three wins each. Three games had two wins each. And 
and this is just interesting fact, unmatched, when we debated it, would it qualify for the theme that it won now? Because it won the under 1,000 on Board Game Geek, and today it's, as of writing all these numbers down, which was last week, it is sitting at 491. <laughs> wow. It climbed up, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. So Ooh. I just thought that was an interesting fact. But, yes, now we can go over to the comments. That's awesome. That. I had no idea about that. That's really interesting. All right. So our comments, as we said, we put these eight and we locked them in and had you, the viewers, vote for them. But we also allowed comments. And Michael started us off by saying Mansions because it's the only one I've played. Which is it's fine. Play, uh, we, we don't tell you how you should vote. We even allow you to vote for many of the games on there. It's your decision, and you can yep. explain to us how you do it. The only time we ever locked it is for this specific reason. So you can even vote for games that get added on. But this was important for this reason. And if that's the only one you played, then vote for it. Kit adds on. He's logged yep. hundreds, if not thousands of hours in Gloomhaven. He finished the man main campaign with a three-person group back in 2018, while at the same time making it about halfway through with another four-player group. This past 12 months, we finished about 80% of another run on Tabletop Simulator. The narrative is forgettable, but the gameplay still keeps me coming back for more. Very cool. Colonel said, Mansion <coughs> me because not only is the game great, but the minis are useful in many other Arkham Files games. Okay. I'm going to let you go ahead and take Kyle because I'll take the next one. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Kyle says Gloomhaven was the first game that my partner got interested in and allowed me to game more at home as I had a second player for non-solo gamers. And that's important. So the next one on the list here. I know specifically what's going on here. That's why I said I'll take it. Angel says RPG in tabletop form. His vote was to Gloomhaven uh, without a huge tight commitment. And that's true. I mean, you do have the time commitment to play the game itself, but you're not sitting there for three, four hours to play the game, maybe an hour, hour and a half for Gloomhaven. Very cool. Nikki says Gloomhaven was the first big game I really got into. I love Quacks because I find it relaxing, but Gloomhaven got me started in the rabbit hole that is board gaming. That's crazy if this is what started her in tabletop <laughs> in the tabletop hobby because right. that's 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 a big game. Uh, mm -hmm. Jim says horrified because it's the only one he's played. And Scott final, finalized it with saying these are two different to pick one, which is the best depends more on my mood and number of players. And that's fair. Yep, they're all in their champions edition for a reason. So we can't wait to talk to you about them. Um, we also do have some honorable mentions on our end as well. Um, we do. So we, we were a little privy into the into the information a little bit more. Not so much that we didn't have access to everybody else. Just we're the only ones who are ridiculous enough to go back and let's watch a year's worth of our <laughs> of our list and whatnot. Well, luckily, we started keeping meticulous notes, made it a lot easier to dig through this. Than, yep. But even then, it still took me an hour just to get the polls going or the information going down and then reiterating to you. And you're like, okay, we should do this and make the ones who won more our top eight or our top seeds and stuff like that. So I was like, it took us a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think what we came out with makes a lot of sense and it's really good. Oh, yeah. uh, let's talk about our our personal honorable mentions. What three games did we talk about that didn't make it into the champions list, but we want to bring up as champions before? I will go first, and I'm going to start with my number three honorable mention. That's for sale. Man, do I love this game. This is what, what got me going on. on uh, I don't remember if it's uh, Rudiger Dorn or Stefan Brendorf. Uh, I forget the, the designer of for sale, but this game is brilliant. Just two mm -hmm. different bids, two different bid phases. Both of them make perfect sense, but they're both very different and they're easy to get along with. It, it's just, it's it so smart. plays so quickly. It plays so quickly, but it, it's satisfying too. It's yeah. different than just like a quick, oh, I play. If it was one round, then it'd be kind of boring. But the fact that it's the two back-to-back -back rounds, yeah, that's what makes it brilliant. You, you bid on something, you use those to bid on something else. It's so and cool. the thing is, what I like about it is the loop, too. It's basically I'm using the money that I have to bid on the, the 
I guess the house or the building that I'm going to buy. And yep. then I'm going to sell that building to get the money back. Cause that's going to be my victory points at the end of the game. I just, I love that little loop of it. And just so everybody know for sale won the auction and bidding uh, version of top eight debate. Yeah, it did. There you go. That was my number three. All right. So my number three is dice forge. And this was the winner of ancient themes it's still one of my favorite games to pull out if I just want to play a fun game. Just roll some dice, get some resources, buy or fight, whatever I want to do. Um, I haven't played it since I received the expansion for my birthday, which was back in August. I'm hoping that changes soon. It's just, it's hard for me to get this one to the table because of the lockdown. I just haven't been able to play it. Uh, I'll even admit the theme is barely there, but it's still a fun game to play nonetheless. But I, what I really like about it is that it's a quick game once you know how to play it. It moves pretty quickly. You're just rolling your dice. You're getting your resource in. And you're getting stuff on everybody's turn. You're only playing specifically the game on your turn, either to go buy more uh, dice to change your dice faces or go use your resources to get a certain card to get your victory points and maybe special abilities and stuff like that. But it's a little bit difficult to learn and a little bit to teach because there's a lot going on. But once you get going, you're like, oh, wow, this is simple. Just take this out, put this in. And my my biggest complaint with it, even though it's important to it for it, is having to reset the game <laughs> because of the dive face. I mean, to make sure you put all the ones back. And yeah. But other than and that, love Dice Forge. Dice Forge is phenomenal. My number two, you could probably take a wild crack at. I'm pretty sure you'll figure it out. Magic the Gathering or Azul? Neither. Wow, really? Neither of those. Come uh, on. I thought that, that the reason why I think this one would be your number one, that's Carcassonne. It's not. Because mm. Carcassonne is my number one, so I'll talk about that one first. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll just try and figure out the other one. But Carcassonne is my number one, and it's my favorite game of all time. That's enough. Uh, it won at least one of the champions. It's representing. That's good enough for me. You never played Carcassonne. Ah. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Uh, so since he talked about Carcassonne, uh, that was the winner of Rio Grande games. Darn right. All right. Well, I'll go to my number two real quick. And a caveat here for my number two and my number one honorable mention. They were both kicked out of the top eight debate because uh, Castles of Burgundy, which is 15, and Pandemic Legacy Season 1 were two, kicked them out. These were the next two highest that were in it until those got came up. And the first one being one I've talked about a lot, one I've played a lot, and there's a bird right above my head that tells you what game it is. Yep, Wingspan. Wingspan is my number two game here. It, it was the winner of Animal Games. Again, probably one of my favorite engine builder games, if not my favorite. I also like the fact that it's a game that can draw people into the hobby that wouldn't be caught dead playing board games beforehand because it's got such an interesting theme that... You see people, uh, I've been, I'm in the Wingspan Facebook group, and they even talk about it. There was a question about a month ago or so that said, were you already a board gamer and became a birder because of Wingspan, or were you a birder uh, and then got into board games because of Wingspan? And I have to say about 70% of the people in that group said they were already bird watchers when Wingspan came out, and then they started playing board games and really enjoyed how modern board gaming is. And that's a very rare game that can draw people from the outside into the hobby, specifically not using someone like um, my buddy Daniel over there who teaches games and shows them at a shop when he could. This is someone who was like, oh, they got a board game based on birds and they played it and became into the board game hobby. And that says something. And then, of course, with it being a Stonemeyer game, it's well produced. It's well supported. Uh, they're all they're drawing expansions. In fact, they just gave new eggs to the game, which I should be getting soon, where they're speculating. So they look more like bird eggs. <laughs> so yeah, that's, it's, that's awesome. Very cool. Uh, my next one <laughs> now is my number two. I did you figure out which one it was? You kind of shook your head like you did. I'm thinking it's Jaipur. Jaipur, yeah, it is. It, yeah, because Jaipur is up there with Carcassonne. It's Oh, man. I, I want to say, like, my top 10 games of all time include Carcassonne, of course, but I think Bonanza and Jaipur are both in there. Like those you can are see Bonanza. Cool. I like Jaipur, but I don't think it would be in my top 10, but it would be high. I can tell you that much. I really do dig Jaipur. 
Have you downloaded and played the app yet? No, I oh, I might have. I think I have it. Okay. I just haven't played it in a while. If you if you get a chance, you should play it more because as you go to different regions of India, mm -hmm. they give you different like variable wind conditions. So like one of them, you're playing against AI no matter what, and it's like a campaign thing, and you might have to start playing like where the tokens are the are the lowest in value and then climb upward. Or you might have some where they're all the same value straight through. Or you might have some where your hand limit is like 10 cards instead of instead of uh, seven. Or you might have to like have even four cards or fewer. Or you might have to get like different weird combinations of things. It does a really great job of adding a new flavor to it. And basically every variable that they can change, they did. It was really neat. Um, but yeah, Jaipur, it's the best two-player card game as, as far as money can buy you. I really truly believe that. Um, yeah, no, I don't disagree. It's a great game. I have a good time playing it. I just, I don't see personally for me to own it because you and a mutual friend have it, and I'm pretty much going to play it with you because I played it with my wife, and she was okay with it. She just didn't care much for it. Yeah, yeah, and and see, I don't know what it is about it, but it hits on every little every little note perfectly for me. And so I I I knew it was going to win when it was like one of the higher seeds for uh, Vincent do trade artwork. Mm -hmm. That that was the category I won with. I knew I could push hard enough for it to win. I know it can't hold its own against like something like Gloomhaven, of course, but I really did know that that was the category when it came up. I'm like, that it's in the running. We got this. I can push it. If I remember so correctly, I think it was a runner up for two player games, too. I think it barely lost out to uh, uh, Seven Wonders Duel. Yep. I'll yep. look that up later, but it, it was up there for sure. Yeah. You and I both agreed how, how brilliant it is. So, those are my top three. For sale, Jaipur, Carcassonne. Do you want to guess what my number one is? Uh, Gloomhaven? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's on the actual list. Um, let me see here. There's two reasons why it's number one, just so you know. Is it Terraforming? No, it's been banned. It's not Terraforming Mars, right? It wouldn't be Terraforming Mars. Yeah. Terraforming Mars hasn't been banned. Oh, no, not banned. It, it was pushed off because it was list. Is it Terraforming Mars? Mm-mm. Oh, okay. And it's not... I don't think no, Terraforming Mars never won one. Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay. What about Raiders of the North Sea? Nope. And I don't know. My favorite worker placement game. I mean, I know it. I'm just forgetting it. Off the top of my head. It's not, uh, it's not Stone Age. Nope. But it's made by Stone Meyer. <laughs> oh, viticulture. Yeah, why didn't? Okay. You know. Two reasons why it was my number one. One, I figured it wouldn't be on your list, and I wanted to bring it up. And yep. two, I really like viticulture, so of course it was going to be on my list. This was the second game knocked off the list. This viticulture was ranked twenty three. Wingspan was ranked twenty. Those were the two that were going to be coming. But I wanted to pay special homage to viticulture because it was the first winner of the top eight debate. It won the worker placement games uh, category, which was our first ever uh, top eight debate. Again, still my favorite worker placement game, even though there are some up there in the running. I think if I get a couple more games in Anachrony, Anachrony can probably jump up that list as well. Uh, again, another well-produced game from Stillmeyer Games. I, what I like about it, it's, it's very interesting. It had a different theme at that time. There's a lot more about vineyards and wine now, but when it came out, it, there wasn't a lot about baking wine and growing a vineyard and stuff like that. So I really like that. Um, and I think for me, the reason why I really enjoy this one is because of the Grande Worker. The fact that even though I could be blocked out of spots, I could still use it if I really, really need to plant something or I need to get another worker for later in the season as long as I hold them all the way through. I really like that aspect. Yes, it's a bit longer for a worker placement game because it's also like that engine building where you start with very little and you have to keep moving forward. But once it ramps up, it ramps up. And so, yeah, worker placement had to be my number one for two reasons. One, it's a worker placement game. And two... It's our first ever top eight debate winner. Was it really? Mm hmm I didn't realize that. Okay, that's an interesting statistic, and I knew you purposely waited to tell me that. Wow, I didn't realize that. That's, that's fascinating. Our first top eight debate was the top eight debate worker placement games, and Viticulture won that one. Huh. 
Very cool. Well, that's awesome. All right. Well, good job to Viticulture. <laughs> All right. right. You ready to get into this? Let's do this. It is debate time. As we said earlier, the first round, we normally just try and go through it kind of quick, try and argue for our side. We'll get a side at random, which is fine by us. Um, once we get that side assigned to us, of who's arguing first, with a combination of the coin of the doom and your hat pulling random papers. Actually, it's cup of doom now. The cup of doom, the coin of doom plus the cup of doom. That'll decide who argues the first one. We will make our cases for that game. And then the next one, or the next, uh, the, the winner of that round moves on to the semifinals and then the finals, et cetera. And the, the big thing about one, this is because we love all these games, we really are going to have to try our best to take our bias out of this. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's going to be less of uh, us arguing our points and more of us going down to the breakdowns. So with you that want, being said. You want to explain the breakdowns? Yeah, let's actually explain how this works instead. You know, for the people who do it. Uh, for some listeners, you get another criteria. Straightforward, uh, standard rules. Um, if you uh, if you shake your head, you lose a point or do something disrespectful. <laughs> if you put a picture of the... All right, he's master, stalling, so I'll go ahead and start. The first category on our criteria is ease of play. It's basically the simplicity and familiarity of the mechanism, how um, how familiar you are. So like a worker placement, a lot of people are familiar with that. Or roll and move, case in point, Monopoly. Non-board gamers know how that works. Um, the likelihood of getting to the table, whether it be because of the familiarity of the mechanism or the theme of the game, as well as it, how likely it is to be analysis paralysis. How prone is it to be where someone just gets stuck in the middle of their move and not sure what they're going to do? Okay. The next category, if you touch your head, you gain a point. <laughs> and if you do something like put the picture of the taskmaster in a bu- the taskmaster into a bucket, you lose two points. So <laughs> all right, the next one on the list, not ignoring what he's saying over there is art and production. Okay. Art and production. I'll have to explain that to you later. I, I don't even think it makes sense, but art and production. Uh first off, art is the first category of that. Secondly, pieces of components, quality of the components, durability. And, and it's not just like if the game has many. We're also talking about the cardboard or how well the board is component-wise. Yep. yep, exactly. And then lastly, the graphic design. How well does that enhance your ability to play the game? If it's an icon crazy, then we might knock it down. But if it's a wall of text every card, that's probably worse. So Yeah, it's so it's just where's a good medium with it? And that's also uh, the biggest factor in that is also for Daniel and I, uh, you don't know color. we're colorblind. So it doesn't work well for colorblind folk. If they, if you, have you seen the dice in Coimbra recently? I know it's a tangent. But no, I no, just, you brought this up. Yes. But I heard about that okay. more because oh, I think you goodness. brought it up when we were talking about Sagrada and I had issues with Sagrada. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, yep. that will get a knock from us because we want all, all everybody to play all games as best as possible. And when there's a colorblind issue, like for us, it makes it difficult. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So the third criteria on our list here is replay value, the length of time of the game and how well it scales. So does four players add way too much time if you're playing from two to four? A case in point of this, smash up. Smash up plays really quickly with two to three players, but if you add a fourth player, it can get really long. So that's why we're talking about the length of time and the scaling well, um, as well as the minimum number of plays to get the complete feel of the game. Do you play it once and that's it? That's all you need to know? You know how it plays? Or do you need, is there a couple things that are nuances that are different for you to get that full or campaign in that matter, which there's a couple on this list. <laughs> As right, well that, as yeah. expandability. Uh, does it already have expansions? We're allowing up to one possible future expansion if we believe it's coming up. And we'll use Space Base as an example because Shy Pluto is volume one. We're assuming there's going to be a volume two. Yep. As well as c- there are expansions that are confirmed by designer and publisher. As I talked about Wingspan, it has s- uh, seven or er, six expansions planned to cover all seven continents. The base game is based in the North America, so there's supposed to be six expansions after that. Okay. And then 
Uh, the next category is meaningful choice. How well can you impact your future strategy in the game, pre-planning your turns for not only the next turn, but the end of the game? How well can you impact your the other player's strategy? And that's specifically affecting how they play based on how well you do or don't play. And lastly, can you still play well with making arbitrary choices that we consider is a bad thing? Dang, yep. If, if you have all the options, do you then have none of the options? And finally, the last category that we base all this on is game immersion. Does the game fit the category the best? Or in this case, does the theme match the mechanism? Because uh, we have to interchange that part depending on what we're debating. This one, it has to be the theme matching the mechanism. Does it work well? Player interaction, does it lead to a lot of table talk or does it lead to a lot of hmm, hmm, it's very quiet and people just looking at the board and not really interacting with one another as well. And this is a big important one, memorable moments. It's also a bit more on the bias side to out of all our criteria, but it's that one that's going to be what's causing you to jump up from the table and scream across the room saying yes and have everybody turn their head and look at what you're doing. There you go. You ready? Yeah, one second before okay. that is all said and done. If there is somehow, somewhere, a tie based off these five criteria where we just can't come up with a winner, that's why we have the poll in the fan vote. They are our tiebreaker. Very good. Cool. Now we're ready. Now we're ready to go. We're going into the first round. This is Bloomhaven versus Castles of Burgundy. Probably one of starting. the most difficult one for us. Mm -hmm. I will be starting this off and arguing for one of them. And I know what I'm probably going to get. What do you think you're going to get? I'm thinking Gloomhaven. Nope, you got... Uh, can you see that? Castles of Burgundy. Burgundy. Fantastic. I'll go with it. Yeah, Castles of Burgundy. No, it needs to move on. Honestly, we've already agreed that it's a better game. I know it's not... <laughs> I was just waiting for the face. No, I mean, but we, we've discussed this before. As far as, like, hardcore legitimate strategy, it is, it is, it, it's... It didn't have to go up against Gloomhaven when we were talking about that. It is slightly less random than Gloomhaven. Now, Gloomhaven... Yes, hear me out. <laughs> Wait, is there some, Now that I'm thinking about it, is there any kind of random variable in Gloomhaven? Not particularly. The only only randomness in it is your modifier deck. And that's because it comes a plus deck, yeah. one or a negative or a double or something like that. And that could be negated as you're leveling up. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you have to level up in order for it to negate, though. Like, it, in... Yes, there's technically random in Castle of Burgundy as to what dice you roll. But is there ways to mitigate it? Yes. Is it really random? Not really, because every one of the six options you have per action, the, the fact that you have two dice means you have two actions on your turn. The numbers that they show give you a general spot of the board of where you can draft it. And since they're universal, you could use a six and then a one. You mm -hmm. can change it. You can flip a, a six to a one. Yep, you can flip a six to a one. It, uh, the numbers don't actually matter. It, the, what you roll does not technically affect the game it just gives you which variable you can you use to get the best uh, option you have. You can do just as well not changing things as as you can changing your dice bases and, and planning for that and getting the workers to modify it. They both work really well. I think Castle Burgundy is um, a better game. I'm not saying it's more fun. I just feel it's a better game. Like there's there's just more more gen genuine depth to it now don't shake your head yet hear me out i now would it win every category no and i'm immediately going to throw one at gloomhaven because i already know it's going to win art and production clearly <laughs> it gets that well now, when they threw basically everything in it including the kitchen sink from one of your posts yeah and yeah exactly quite literally like the new expansion with the kitchen sink. Uh, I need to figure out what I'm doing for the next fourth of uh, April first for board games. Mm. Yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll fill a box of letter jam with jelly. Oh wait, no, I've seen that done before. Um, that was a really great YouTube video. Anyway, 
No, uh, I would give it Game Immersion for Gloomhaven, and I would give Bard Production for Gloomhaven. Absolutely. But Meaningful Choice? I don't know. Maybe I'd probably give Gloomhaven Ease of Play, too. It's a little easier, probably. It's easier to teach, I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Yeah, Castle of Burgundy is It's, kind of it's a bit fiddly, but because there's so much going on in Castles of Burgundy, it makes it a little harder. Right. It's not that Castles of Burgundy is difficult. It's really not. You have four actions that you can choose. But every building can do a different action. Mm -hmm. And they work in different ways. Yeah, it's a bit of a slog. And I would give it meaningful choice. And, uh, and... I can't do that. No, I would give Castle of Burgundy meaningful choice. I, I, I mean, you can. You... But I would call it more a wash than before I give it to Castle Burgundy, and I'll hear me out on this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the thing about it with meaningful choice, we have the criteria. Let mm -hmm. me just pull that up just to make sure I'm doing this right. Mm -hmm. So the impact on other player strategies. This is important because you find out what happens if someone isn't working as a team. So it can impact your strategy. If someone Lero Jenkins into a room and that gets swarmed, you're screwed on as well, especially if you're playing a two, three players. If one person does what, say, World of Warcraft, when we talk about it, Leroy Jenkins into a room and gets everything going over there, it could end up being bad. So there's your impact on other people's strategy. Gloomhaven's impact is much more prevalent on that part of it. The impacting on your long-term strategy, you have to play your cards very smart because it's a puzzle and you have a timer based on your cards. So if you're playing a character that can only have 10 cards and you're playing two per turn and either you choose to use that card as it's intended, which means you'll lose that card, which means your timer is being burnt a lot quicker before you're hitting your end goals, that could be dangerous as well. Or you used your card as a basic. The only really lucky thing in it is the attack modifier cards. That's really it. Everything else, you have to make a strategic choice on how you're doing it. And here's the thing. Like a lot of legacy games and a lot of campaign games, you can make choices to mitigate your luck in your deck. But later on, when you get further on, and I don't want to be too spoilery about it, but you can start actually adding things to your cards as well, where they can do certain um, type effects on other players and so there's a lot of meaningful choice in Gloomhaven, even if you just start in the beginning. You can't really make an arbitrary choice in this game. You have to talk about it with your other players because it's like, do I go pop that door now or do we wait till everybody's properly set up before we hit that door and everything comes at us? I, I don't Where it is in Castles of Burgundy, yes, you have a lot of meaningful choices, but the choices that you make in the game may only slightly make an impact on the other player's stuff because they can use the dies to go to a different allotment or buy a different building or place a different thing into their thing. So yeah. because your dice is not affecting their dice except for what you're taking from the main board. Yeah, I I, I don't disagree with that part. I'm just saying that 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 attack modifier deck, like you're you're saying it like it's a like most of them, yeah, are only like plus one, zero, minus one. You know, that's fine. But well, the fact that there are some cancels and there are the, the no, no, okay, ones. Like there's one cancel at the start of the game. There's one double at the start of the game. So they kind of yeah. negate each other. There, you can get more based on things that happen into it. It's called curse and bless. But those leave the game or after that scenario. You don't keep those permanently. Right. So only your deck only has the one cancel and the one thing. That's not that bad, especially since it could be mitigated as you're leveling up based on perks and stuff like that. But you're still beholden to when they come up. And in my experience, every time that I didn't need that 2x, it popped up. It doubled my damage to like two. <laughs> and then the cancel was when I finally hit them for like six. And it's like, nope, no, now you're not. You know, you still, to, you still have the ability to thin your deck. And then, it's exciting, but I just I don't I don't feel that that's as meaningful of a choice as I, I feel it's more obvious of what you're playing. And like I said, than, than it it's is. more of a wash to me just because of that one little thing. Because again, you're impacting other people more so than Castles and Burgundy, and you you can sort of make an arbitrary choice because you could be just like you know what this dice doesn't really do anything. I'll just get workers for it. Yeah. It's a still a choice, but it's not as meaningful as, say, 
I don't want to burn this card too early, but someone over there really needs to get healed because they decided to be a bullet sponge in the beginning of the game instead of at the end of the game. You know, but here's the thing, though. Regardless of us debating it right now, I've already given it to Gloomhaven. You're just trying to push it harder. This proves me that you haven't removed your said bias. No, 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 no. I don't, uh, no. Uh, 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 uh. don't even start that. You got you to gotta admit, yeah. my meaningful choice was actually a sound argument. It's a sound argument as far as as far as impacting other players, yes. But as far as impacting your long-term strategy, Castle Okay, I could give you Castles of Burgundy. And non-arbitrary but... choices, too, because mm. of that random variable. It is. Now, I'm not saying it's it's not more fun. It's more exciting. It's more fun. I give you that. It's fine. Gloomhaven still moves on. It still gets the three points. I'm just saying that I it's there's more meaningful choice in Castles of Burgundy. With that being said, I'm fine calling it for Gloomhaven. Oh, wait, these are the next ones. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do we yeah, agree? I, I'll, I'll give you that just because I don't want to belay the point since it's already late. <laughs> <laughs> this is only but I still think there's a lot more meaningful choices than you're giving it credit for. There's a lot of meaningful choices in Gloomhaven. The it's that it's the modifier deck that, that negates that. There's nothing that's that impactful that negates or that adds that so much crazy random in Castle of Burgundy. There's not. But there, there's, there's, there's a time where in Castles of Burgundy, even though the dice numbers don't mean anything, if I don't have the workers to get the thing I actually need to do in that game, there, so there, say I roll a three and I need a six and I only have one worker, I can only move it up one spot. So I don't is, need a four or a two. No, that, that, that's, it's less meaningful, yes, but there's never any moment in Castles of Burgundy where your turn is negated by a random flip of a card or a roll of a die, a random variable. It's never negated. And, and technically, your turn ball. isn't negated. Your attack is negated. You can still move and do the rest of your turn, like looting. Oh, well, yeah. It's like, well, let me just dance around like a jester in a medieval court, and you can laugh at my amusement while I try to stab you and then trip and fall on That could be sport. important. I've actually seen it at Jaws of the Lion where someone's like, oh, my attack got negated, but it helped them draw things away from other players because they were the bullet sponge. <laughs> That, that doesn't no, but that's that's against what your strategy was. If you're going for an attack and it negates it, you don't do the attack. You All right, Gloomhaven's moving on. Let's move to two versus seven. <laughs> All right, two versus seven. Quacks of Quedlinburg versus Pandemic Legacy Season One. And this is probably your toughest bracket. Uh, no, I have a pretty clear favorite between the two. Ooh, this is gonna be tough. I'm gonna say your clear favorites, maybe Quacks. We'll see. Uh. You will be starting off this argument. I get Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Okay. And before I get started, i got to make sure I move this out of the way. All right. Which is interesting about this. Pandemic Legacy Season 1, which is ranked 2 on Board Game Geek, is actually our 7 seed. <laughs> yep. Uh, so what isn't there to say? What What's there to say about this game that we haven't talked about there's a lot going for this game here. It's a very well done campaign game on an already well designed game to begin with that does lead to a lot of table talk because you have to plan out your moves as best as possible, especially as you're going into the later part of the game. You like mentioning this on all the top eight debates that has been brought up. There's that one memorable moment. We all talk about it, but we don't want to say because for those who haven't played it, so there is the memorable moment. Yep. It leads to a lot of interesting choices. Do we let this city fall? This way we can go take care of stuff that's going on over here. Do I use my special ability to fly such and such over here? There's so much, so many things that it comes down to. It's well produced. There's a lot of interesting choices, as I said. It's just, there's a reason why it's ranked two on BGG. It's that phenomenal game. And like I said, it's a campaign that was added on to a game that was already solid. Okay. Is that your argument? That's my argument. Okay, so Quacks of Quedlinburg. Fantastic push your luck game. Did it win two or three? Two, right? It won three. It won three. Yeah, there's a reason for that. Back, back, back push cold your building, luck. push your luck in medieval. Yep, medieval and push your luck. Yeah, there's a reason why it won those three. is because it stands like on the shoulders of all the great games prior to it, and it combines all different amazing mechanisms in it in a really fantastic way. That's why I'm so excited to play uh, Bullet, uh, the new game from Level 99, 
it's because it took that and it made it head to head. It's like it's not just like your pool multiplayer solitaire. You're like straight up bashing everybody. It's amazing. Yeah. So uh, I love that concept of it. It's an amazing push your luck game. It is incredibly fun because you. I love it when like when you've already say okay, well I'm out, and you look at everybody else and they're about half a mile past you, <laughs> and you're like wow, and they're all debating. And they're just staring each other down going, hmm, I'll do one disc if you do it. <laughs> you know, like, you kind of tell them, like, no, I'll do one more. I'll do one more. Let's, <laughs> Let's see what happens. Yeah. Let's see what happens. I've done that before, and I've, like, made so many people bust because of it, myself included. But, you know, it's it, it, make, it allows for that table talk. It allows for that silliness. Yeah. And the team is super quick compared, compared to what it is, and it has all the variable setups and everything that makes uh, the number of choices each time so fun so a lot of modularness to the rules let's break it down ease of play which one's easier oh quite Quedlinburg. i agree pulling stuff out of a bag that's i right. do have to say one thing real quick before we finish the breakdown my only and this is very rare here i i only put down two and one i don't even care for on the cons but my big gripe about it is the chits the cardboard chits I understand what you you're like, you roll your eyes on it, but there's a lot of people who play this a lot. And two, it starts wearing down pretty quickly, those cardboard chits that you pull out of the bag, to the point where a lot of people go for the board game geek upgrades. That, but again, that's really my only major con for this game. That's how much I like it. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a minor con because it doesn't affect gameplay. It's just... It doesn't. Yeah, makes In the components look a little... No, you're not going to feel the difference. You're not going well, to, gonna to feel the difference, but I'm talking about like just the, the visual aspect of the cardboard peeling off itself. Yeah, you know, but it won't affect the gameplay. So I don't disagree. I mean, but like, what's the op? Like, uh, I'm, I referenced it before. Bullet kind of did the fix. They also sold it with the optional upgrade of wooden bits. Yeah, I only got the cardboard bits. Yeah, I got the wood, and it's awesome. Like, it's, it's, but it, it Functionally, yeah, I didn't need the wood because it's all in a bag anyway. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just wanted. I'm just saying that's just it's a quibble, yeah. it's a con, but it's just a minor one. Yeah, which is fair, which is fair. Um, now, Pandemic Legacy Season One, and I did forget about this, is that uh, in there they had to have a little piece of paper that had a reminder for one little change that happened that got past the printing, mm. and it was like, oh look, when this happens, you need to do this instead. That's all it yeah. is. It didn't spoil anything. It's just like, hey, as a reminder, like this was a thing that went through. And was yeah, I think that was that was just the first print run, though, right? Yes, yes. Because and I didn't I, have that in mind. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't believe it was past that. There, there was a small one, and then the next print run they fixed it. But uh, Z-Man Games has done that before, where they've had printing errors in case of pandemic, the tenth anniversary or whatever, the really fancy version. It was yeah. missing one of the roads. For no reason. <laughs> Didn't they send out like a sticker just to put it on the board? Yeah, yeah which, I mean, really, what's 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 a better option, right? Yeah, like, send a sticker or reprint the board. Reprint the board and then sending it to everybody who's bought it. And, of course, yeah. they all want it for free, but that's that's not fair. I mean, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. realistically. Um, like recently, one of the Kickstarters, I'm not going to name it, but it, it got shipped. I recently received it shipped and one of the trays was damaged because of the way that they packaged it. And, and I feel bad for the company because they're going out of their way to really try and make it right for people. I'm not claiming it. I don't care. You know, like, it's it's a piece of plastic. Like, okay. Yeah. Like, I get you really want it, but at the same time, like, I'm not going to demand a new one. I know how much of a pain that is and that they're still trying to do, make it right for everybody. But yeah, yeah. Does it cost them any money? No. That's fine. I can make do. So, anyway. I digress. That was my rant of the day. Easy uh, playing quacks, we agreed. Yeah. So uh easy playing quacks. Um art and production. Mm. Would you give that to pandemic legacy because of your horrible with the chips? For me, it would be, be just slightly though, because pandemic really has good stuff, mind you. It's the same stuff yeah. they put in the base game with yeah. some added stuff, but the board quality is nice. The graphic design on the board is really nice. I really like the art. So I think the art in Pandemic is really good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Not to say the art is bad in uh, Quacks of Quinlan, but... Oh, it's phenomenal. 
Yeah. You just, you hardly really see it because most of the time the stuff with the best art is in the bag. And then when you pull it out, it's kind of there. The cards have a little bit of stuff, but yeah, I'll give art and production the pandemic. Okay. Meaningful choice, pandemic. Pandemic, hands down. Uh, honestly, your gripe about the, the, the cards on Gloomhaven, you're literally pulling out of the bag. Yeah, you get to put what's in there, but also other stuff gets put in there that you don't Oh, yeah. Know. No, well, I mean... Yeah, no, like if it were between Quacks and Gloomhaven, then I'd still give it to Gloomhaven because it, it's it's so less likely where there's uh, there's oftentimes you'll buy a, a piece of cardboard, put it in the bag of Quacks and never see it again. There's no mitigation of that whatsoever. Yeah. It's just that's how it'll work. And so, no, that's a big knock to it, in my opinion. That's an incredibly arbitrary choice. Replay value. Uh, pandemic. Pandemic. And immersion is pandemic, in my opinion, as well. I can't disagree with you on that one. As much as I like Quacks, I really do. In fact, I probably like Quacks more than I like Pandemic Legacy Season 1, as good as it was. Yeah. Um, no, so between mine, you were wrong. Quack, uh, pandemic is easily the pandemic. Ah, I, I just try and take a stab because I, was, I know how much you like playing that one. If, if there was more story to it and you could add like an expansion to add, continue the storyline of season one it probably would have unseated Carcassonne as my favorite game of all time it was that close so you want to know something interesting I do the ones that went head to head a lot of times are going head to head again a lot there's a reason only in the second round this time yep (laughs) it's gonna hurt all right uh, our next round is Horrified versus Space Base. This is now the, your hardest one, I'm sure. And you will start off our argument. Yeah, it's one of my hardest ones. Uh, I think 1 8 was one of my, my hardest one because I really do dig Castles of Burgundy. All right, so I'm, I'm arguing this. Yep. I have to argue Space Base. That stays, that's gone. I just don't want to get these all mixed up yet. All right, space base. Well, this one's simple enough. We've only just recently argued it not too long ago, I think about two or three weeks ago. But oh man, is it going up against one of my favorite games. But also, this is one of my favorite games. And to me personally, this is one of the best implementations of I roll, everyone gets something. We've talked about it last week. Uh, now that I think of it, when comparing it to Machi Coral, this is the best implementation to that, in my opinion. What I like about this, and this is a very big pro about Space Base, there's very little downtime because you're paying attention to what everybody else is doing. And so that makes this game go quickly, in a sense. Uh, another real big pro about this one, and it, it's tough how we're going to argue ease of play on this one because they're both very easy to teach and very easy to learn. Now, I say space space may be a little bit easier because you just have to pay attention to the thing. Only problem is the iconography. That's the big thing about space space is the iconography. Horrified, it's not that hard. It's just that for each monster, you have to learn a different way to play. So if you're doing the creature from the Black Lagoon, you have to put these certain colors here to move the boat. You got to go break up coffins for Dracula. You have to raise the humanity for Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein before they meet each other in form of, and they all work great and they do really well and they kind of work in the same way. It's just depending upon the combos or the numbers of the items that you pick, uh, have to pick up. But I think Space Base is one of the best games I've played in quite a while and for as simple as it is because honestly, it's a very simple game. Um, it also has a campaign style expansion, which we talked about earlier, Shy Pluto. Mm-hmm. Also has a big box expansion, which adds an additional player count. So take it with you what you will, where Horrified doesn't have an expansion, though I want one really, really bad. <coughs> um, so if I would go down the list here, I would think Ease of Play slightly space based, maybe. You could probably sway me on this one. Uh, Art and production, I think it loses hands down. <laughs> I'm sorry. As much as I like Space Base, the, we've talked about it last week. One, it's a bit cartoony. Mm-hmm. And two, my big thing, we're talking about graphic design and quality. 
it's the player boards. The fact that they're not recessed, so those cubes can just slide all over the board if just even if a slight bump on the table, yeah. that's a big issue for me. And it's a big issue for a lot of people. Yeah. So yeah. other than that, I think Space Base is a great game. Let's hear what you got to say about Horrified. Okay. So, yeah, no, Horrified is one of the best gateway games, especially in the cooperative series. Not only does it hit on a really great theme, a really great theme it's very simple to learn. Because once you get the basics of it, then understanding that one extra step of what the monsters do, that's menial. Uh, you know, the art and production and just the whole graphic tone of it is really fantastic. It hits thematically. It feels pretty good. It's not as thematic as, as many of the other games that we've talked about, but it's certainly more thematic than Space Racers. I agree yeah. with you on that one. I mean, yeah, it, there's there's no doubt about it than, than that. So if we were to break it down, ease of play. Like I said, this is the one you could sway me on. I think Space Base is uh, slightly easier just because it's much easier to teach how the dice work. But again, the iconography could be a problem. Yeah. No, I, so what icons do you have, right? You have the charge counters. You have the, uh, the, the spaceship for victory points. You have the economy planet and you have coins. All right. Course. Let's make this easy for us. Ease of play, which is uh, the simplicity and familiarity of the mechanism. Which one do you think wins this one? Familiarity of the mechanism. I feel rolling dice is simpler than, uh, I agree. than uh, action selection. The likelihood to get to the table. Horrified. I agree with that. Which lends itself more to analysis paralysis? Space space. I actually have to agree with you on that one. So it looks like Horrified wins ease of play. Okay. All right. Anything else jump out at you here? Um, meaningful choice goes to Horrified. I agree. So that's two for Horrified right now. And um, I have to say game immersion goes to Horrified too. I was going to say art and production goes to Horrified. So and, I, and I give you art. Value. No, I, I would have said art and production too. But I think game immersion, more people get immersed in that. Then I think replay value also goes to horrified. Really? I do. I do. Because because no oh, no. No, I'm sorry. Space space. That would be yeah, the only I agree, one. That, I agree with you on that. I was like <laughs> So horrified moves on. Four to one. That's why I was shocked. I was like, wow, it's gonna be five nothing. <laughs> I that's why I said it. I was like, man, that sounds really off. That was just me not me not uh uh, being crazy. All right. Our last one of the quarterfinals of the championship edition. Seven Wonders Duel versus Mansions of Madness. This is interesting. A two-player only game going up against a huge, big box. Grandiose yeah, app driven crazy in-depth, thematic. Yeah. He's arguing. First person who's arguing. Boom. You are starting us off again. What do I get here? I get Seven Wonders Duel. I knew you liked that one. I do dig this one, but man, this is an interesting bracket right here. Uh, before we get going, I got to make sure I make this mark here. All right. Seven Wonders Duel. Easily one of the best two-player games out there. Um, it's a very good implementation of a very popular game for two players because the two players of that game sucked really bad to the point where they're like let's fix this i also really like the fact that it's well done drafting for a two-player game the way they set up and get the cards there's some issues where sometimes you're kind of you have to take this and then a card flips and it's the military that other person needs so there is a bit of randomness in this it can be negated somewhat but there is there um it lends itself to a lot of smart choices in the game. Now, how do you play this? Do I play to try to get as many victory points or do, do I take that risk and try to go for that science victory? Or do I play the military route and try to win that little tug of war game right there? Because the further along I get, the victory points they lose. Um, and I gain, I have more military might. So it's really, really interesting how this pulls. It's a really good game. Um, I give it ease of play, hands down. It's probably one of the easier games to learn compared to Mansions of Madness. Mind you, Mansions of Madness is not hard because the app helps you. 
but I think Seven Wonders is just slightly better. Uh, overall, unfortunately, I would have to say Mansions of Madness moves on. That's interesting. Um, it is easier to play because the app yeah, does drive it along. It is a better art and production. But I don't think it's meaningful of a choice. As, as no, Wonders. I'll give you that. No, there's a lot more meaningful choice than Seven Wonders. Though. And Mansions of Madness is definitely more immersive. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that, just by going like a criteria, as much as I like Seven Wonders Duel, Mansions of yep. Madness wins because of that friggin' app. <laughs> because yep. it gives you that game immersion built in. Yeah, exactly. It makes everything so much cleaner and it builds that that whole the whole theme. Yeah, I completely agree. So that means we go into our semifinals. Daniel, tell me some stats, man. All right. Just before we move on, number one is going to be facing number seven. This yep. is a matchup. These two have been fighting for quite a long time. Pandemic yep. uh, Legacy Season 1 versus Gloomhaven. We have a bracket that's never happened before, though we thought it had. We have Horrified going up against Mansion of Madness. So we got a horror, a horror bracket again over here. We got yep. a campaign game bracket over here again. But the statistics that you're looking for our eight seed Castles of Burgundy was actually our number two vote getter with 15. Because the people in the comments really like meaningful choices in games. Uh, really? Because our number one was Quaxa Quinlinburg at 20. I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to. They our really like the older thematic games. <laughs> number six, Space Space, was actually our number six vote getter at five. And okay. finally, the last one eliminated was Seven Wonders Duel, which was our four seed. It was actually the fifth best vote getter with six. Wow. Okay. All right. Let's move it on to the semifinals. Our first bracket will be Gloomhaven versus Pandemic Legacy Season 1. And Daniel, I'll be starting this round. Ooh, this is going to be fun. Let's see what happens. I almost kind of want to do Horrified and Mansion of the Madness first. We can. It's our podcast. We could change the rules as we go. Let's change it because I, I that one's going to be tough for us. I feel it is. They've been knuckle draggers before. That's right. Yeah, we'll stick with the normal. Try and Drew. I literally just changed the cup of doom. Never mind. <laughs> we'll go with whatever's in the cup of doom. All right. So, whose argument is it? Uh, mine. Horrified versus horrified versus madness. You get horrified. Legacy. No, it's Horrified versus Mansions and Madness. You got you mixed up, though, didn't I? Yeah. Uh, horrified. So I get Horrified? You get Horrified. I mean, we already know it's a better game. It's more fun. It's not as simple, technically. Technically speaking, it's not as simple. Oh, because of the app integration. Yeah, I give you that. They ease of play. So that, there's only two actions you do on the in the thing. It's literally like move or interact. Like, that's yeah. it. Or fight. Those are your three actions. Um. And I would say Mansions of Madness is more thematic, but your meaningful choice is horrified. I agree. Replay value for minimum number of plays for full experience. Ooh, that's tough. Ease of play I, is horrified. Wait, ease of play is horrified. I say ease of play is horrified. I agree with you. It's much simpler than Mansions of Madness. You do have to do the integration. There's more meaningful choices in Horrified 2, I agree, because, again, Mansions of Madness lends itself to the lock base. It's a fantasy flight game. That's going to be a major detractor for it. Yes. Yeah. Game immersion, I think Mansions of Madness. Yes. Agreed. Art and production, Mansions of Madness. Mansions of Madness. So we're down to two and two. And it goes down to replay value. Horrified yeah. has no expansions. Mansions of Madness does. And it now, even though it scales better, it's still two to four or one to four for Mansion of Madness. It's one to five, I think, for Horrified. It's not technically one, it's minimum two. No, you can play Horrified solo. It even has it in the rule book. You see that, you know, that little thing on the track uh, where you're going to keep an eye on the skull? There's that little arrow that points to three. Uh -huh. That's where you start in solo mode. Oh, okay. All right. I didn't realize that there was a variant. It's not a very, it's literally legitimately in there because if you watch the Rodney Smith, watch it played, it says there's solo rules in the game that I'll let you learn on your own. So which one is the minimum number of plays for full experience? That would be mansions. That has to be mansions, yeah. Yeah, it has to be. 
There's no other option for it. Mm-hmm. So does that and mean Mansions moves on? That it does. And, oh, and mind you, everybody at home listening and those here in the chat, Mansions of Madness second edition, not first edition. Yes. Mansions of Madness moves on, and it will face the next round, either Pandemic Legacy Season 1 or Gloomhaven. Daniel, you will be starting this round. Okay. Uh, what is that? Oh, no, that's in here. Point of Doom. This one's gone. Coin of Doom. All right. It'd be funny if we have to argue the reverse because we both have a favorite here. Absolutely. We absolutely do. And it's We very... don't have to argue the, the reverse. I got Gloomhaven. Okay. So it says Gloom, but there's the, there's the Haven part. Yep. All right. So, God, this is going to be tough. How do we argue this? You know what? Let's make it easier on us. Let's go through the criteria like this with the championship, honestly. Let's, which is easier to learn? Or which is easier to play? Pandemic. Pandemic. I agree. Yeah. Game immersion. <laughs> we'll come back to okay. that. Arm production. <laughs> Probably Gloomhaven. <laughs> yeah, graphic design is good. The, there's, a lot of production and those boards really good too. The tiles that make up the board. So yeah, Gloomhaven. Although the box is just like the way the tiles are made, and they just expect you just dump them in and hope for the yeah. best. No, no, I get you that, but we don't argue the box. We're actually talking about graphic design of the game. We argue the box too. Uh, we have never. Be you, I've tried to bring that up, and you've said we're not arguing the box unless the box is part of a component like architects or not architects. Uh, what is that? Cleopatra. Okay. Or, or tiny right, epic right. tactics. Uh, that's fine. It's just very frustrating. Likelihood of getting it to the table, though, is diminished in Gloomhaven because you, as soon as somebody's like, hey, you want to play Gloomhaven? You're like, I got to set it up. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll see you in an hour. You'd be surprised. I've got more people to play Gloomhaven than I've gotten to play. I'm just saying, but like, you no, 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 I get you. Typically no. planned. You had to plan an hour buffer zone on each side of, of playing Gloomhaven to prep the, the tiles. All right, hold on. Let me go to my criteria list. We already agreed it's easier. Uh, pandemic is easier anyway, so it doesn't matter. I'm just saying. Oh, I know. I'm just I'm trying to get my criteria just way I can have everything on my head. Ease of play, yeah. pandemic. Yes. Art production, Gloomhaven. Yes. Replay value, Gloomhaven. Yeah. Significantly more scenarios, yes. More variability. Plus, there is an expansion for Gloomhaven base. Forgotten yeah. Circles. Yep, there is. Okay, I'll give you that. Uh, so we have one, two. Choice. That, that's a tough one for me because both of them are there. And the thing is, your argument against Gloomhaven where it can negate your attack, yes. there's card flipping in. Yep. The same thing where it's like, okay, we have everything planned. And then outbreaks just go galore just because we yep. got flipped over. So I uh, no, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. Because there are there are instances like if you if the way that the cards are shuffled back onto there, if you get an epidemic really early, that's gonna be way harder to mitigate than it will be otherwise. And, uh, another problem I have with pandemic legacy, and I've mentioned this before, is that where in Gloomhaven, as you get better, you get rewarded. You get to upgrade. You get to take things out of your deck or make things more powerful where it's in the reverse in Pandemic. As good as you're playing, you get punished for playing good because you're taking out reward cards out of the deck. You're taking out your that's, one quiet that, nights. I, huh? I, I don't disagree, but that's just a self-balance thing. What I, I understand that, and I can understand because you're adding as you play bad. Right. But you're not rewarding the players for playing good. You're making them, oh, you're playing too good. Let's make it harder for you as you're going along. My counter argument to that, though, is Pandemic Legacy is one of the few games where you don't just plan for the end of this game. You plan for future games. The fact is that when you tear up a character because they die, which is it's not a spoiler, that's what happens. If your character gets enough wounds... Your character is gone forever. You tear up that card. It's done. In Gloomhaven, you just don't get experience. It's fine. You know, whatever. Or as much experience. And you don't get some of the yes items. Yes and no. But, but, well, you never have, you never have 
that moment where you're thinking, okay, like there's a very good chance that we can win if I do this, but there's also a very high likelihood that this character is going to die for future games. That is a huge thing. Again, yes and no. There is a variant in the rule book that is written if people want to make it more difficult is that there's permadeath in Gloomhaven. Okay. Variant. Set rules. I'm just saying, there's a possibility there. And it's a but, uh, canonical if you, possibility. If you chose for it not to, though, then you don't care. That's what yeah. I'm saying. If you don't play the variant. So, but, okay, that, that, that inv- impacts there, but... Um, yeah, I'm just saying, I'm not saying it's a big enough sway, but I'm saying that's one of the most... How imp- about this? We call it a future. wash. For impacting future strategy, I think that goes to pandemic, that one little section. But that's not what we're talking about, future strategies. It's either other player strategies or long-term strategies. Yeah, long-term strategy, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Because you're planning games ahead, even, which is interesting. But the thing is, you're, you are too in... Um, uh, Gloomhaven, especially after you beat a scenario, you have a choice. Do I go here or do I go here? Because that closes off storyline that you won't see. Yeah, but and that's the same way with Pandemic as well. But the thing is, with that, you don't actually know what you're doing. You don't know which one you're choosing. You, you're given a thematic and a story-driven Technically, story. you don't know what you're doing either in Gloomhaven because you can't look ahead. You're not supposed to look ahead. It even says that in the rule book. It's well, like you, you got to make the choice. Ahead. But I'm saying, like, you, you, you can know that if, if you've boosted up this character to the point where it's a really valuable character, but it's at the verge of dying, you're going to take that in the fact of knowing that, like, I need this guy probably for the next few games and because he's so built up. I can't risk going into I, this. I see what you're saying there, and I argue that point. Without going into spoilers, you know there is something that happens in the late game. So if that player right. has that certain thing, you don't have the choice if they're still in the game or not. Which ties into the theme, yes. Yes. All I'm saying is that it's just it's less impactful for future games. Um, but as far as, let's, let's go to the other one. Affecting other players' strategies. I, I call that a wash, really. But arbitrary choices, you're right. There is more arbitrary, there is more uncontrollable factors in pandemic than there are in Gloomhaven. So I'm willing to call that whole that whole category a wash. That's what I said five minutes ago. Yes. I just <laughs> wanted that to be known that it's a wash. Game immersion. Okay. Where are we at as far as points? It, it's Gloomhaven 2, Pandemic 1, right? Uh let me see. Ease of play gloom, a pandemic, art and production Gloomhaven, meaningful choice, a wash. Re, that's two to one Gloomhaven. Two to one Gloomhaven. And because, honestly, uh, replay value beats, uh, or Gloomhaven gets replay value. Yeah. I honestly do, I'm willing to call it a wash, but I do feel like this, like just the story immersion, like the story is so much richer in pandemic um, than it is in Gloomhaven. That's a minor quibble, but I'm willing But here's to- the thing I've played both games. Well, right. Gloomhaven, more so in the campaign than you have. Yeah. Yeah. And I played all the way through Pandemic Season 1. Okay. Story-wise, they're both really good. Um, yeah. if, if The thing is with Gloomhaven, though, it isn't strictly just the campaign. You have those road cards and those city cards that add more flavor and add more depth to the game as well, not just to the storyline, but it's adding stuff going into your thing, uh, plus your retirement, so leading you to be able to unlock new characters. So, yeah, it's... I feel more thematic in Gloomhaven, and I'm literally tra- taking my bias out of this, because when it comes down to it, Pandemic Season Legacy 1, or just Pandemic in general, you're playing Pandemic with a story going along so it's basically right. hey go here clear this go here do this put this up put this down i have well, haven it changes up how you're playing the game this one hey kill everybody oh now this is going on do you have this specific character because here's the reward for that uh okay if not then this is your option that you got to do or i'm playing another campaign hey i'm doing this all right, you have your own personal goals as well, 
this way be like, okay, I met my personal goal. I can go back and I can retire now. So there's a lot of immersion, immersion in game uh, Bloomhaven because of all the little nuances outside of the main campaign. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't, I don't disagree with that. It's, it seems pretty spot on. Um, I'm just saying like it, it, pandemic is huge. It, 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 it became the number one seed on board game geek. And guess what eliminated it? No, I know. That's just because it didn't get anywhere near as many votes. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a thing. It's just the people who are really passionate about Gloomhaven are really passionate about Gloomhaven. Well, th there's a reason for that. And I'm, I'm trying to take my bias out of this. I've played both of these and I like both of these. I can understand why they're number one and number two on there. But when we're talking about game immersion, does it the theme best match the mechanism? Yes. That's what we're going here. Which one do you think fits just the mechanism better? I feel pandemic. Because it, it the action selection does make a lot of sense as to you're limited on time if you're like an actual scientist trying to combat it. Time is time is the enemy. I see, the and Haven, it's the uh, like, oh well, I'm about to go fight these big bad guys. Let me pick two cards and choose the top and the bottom. Like Oh, but the, yeah, you're That's, picking two cards top and the bottom. I'm taking cubes off the board. I'm really curing diseases by taking cubes off the board if you want to break it down to the bare minimum. Whereas well, no, this one is the like, primary mechanism, no? Is is the primary card is the card play. And so is taking cubes off the board. No, the primary mechanism in pandemic is the action selection. Being in the right place, going it, I mean, you're you're curing diseases. That's the point. I mean, they had to represent it somehow. It makes sense for the cube. See, the thing about the two cards, that makes sense to me. You gotta move up front. This is not like where you can shoot at people. You literally have to go up there and attack people with your thing. So you have your movement. Your heal, yeah. whatever is at the bottom, and you have your attack at top. You have your AOEs. It feels thematic in that aspect. Uh, uh, mentioning it on the comments, it does feel like an RPG. I do get immersed in this series. So, I mean, I'm not going to come to agreement on this. You want to call it a wash for game? I'm going to call it a wash. Like I said, I I feel like we're both very so strongly like we. I see a. I do see it both ways, and that's why I'm saying I'm okay with calling it a wash because I do think. They are just so that much strong in this category that it should be a wash, really. So we have ease of play going to pandemic, art and production going to Gloomhaven, meaningful choice, and and uh, meaningful choice and immersion going as a wash. A wash and replay. So Gloomhaven. two to one is Gloomhaven. Yep, yep. barely. I I do agree with that. Yep. Oh. Uh. I'm not uh, in any way upset with that because I do completely agree with how we argued. It. Honestly, I, I wouldn't have been upset with pandemic going on. I just think for me, the game immersion in Gloomhaven was just more there, but that's also because of my personal taste. And game immersion is really our personal taste. You when, really when, like the Euro aspect of games. I really want to get into the campaign and theme of the games. Pandemic so is the me, most dramatic Euro game that I own. That it's just about. I mean, it really is because what you're doing. Yes, it's technically a Euro thing, but it really does make sense. Like, not none of it doesn't make sense as to what you're trying to do in the game. Like, it, you don't want too many cubes on the board. Yeah, well, you don't want a city overrun with disease. That's that's a perfect comparison. You know, it's the one to one comparison easily. Alrighty, so moving on, we have our number one seed Gloomhaven going against our five seed Mansions of Madness Second Edition. Okay. The vote get, as we see here, horrified, mm -hmm. was tied for seventh place at four. And pandemic season one, if it went to fan vote, was still lost to Gloomhaven because it only had seven votes, but it was our number four game. Mm -hmm. Very good. And our very last round, our finals, is Gloomhaven versus <clears throat> Mansions of Madness. Do we need we to don't choose a side? We go down by the criteria. Yep. Let, let's just run through this, okay. be quick about it if we have to. Yep. Ease of play, Mansions, Mansions of, Madness. of Madness. Art and production, Mansions of Madness. I agree with you just because of the graphic design with that app. Oh, I think the pieces are better too. It's cardboard standees versus minis. Like they're both really good quality. But... Whoa, 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 whoa. Where are you talking about cardboard standees? 
Gloomy even has cardboard standees for all the. Oh models. yeah, for the, the. Well, that's because there's like two hundred bad guys in that game. Sounds like a personal choice. <laughs> There's just a lot in there. I understand why they, but there are minis in it. I'll be honest, really nice the, the yellow and white stands, those are just, just no. I get I, you like, that. Just to tell the I difference like between them. the elite and the normal, I, I agree with you. That's why I agree with yarn production. I think component quality wise, Matches of Madness wins it barely just because their minis are really nice. Mind yeah. you, yeah. I haven't seen the rest of the minis in the uh, Gloomhaven. I think I've only seen like Eight of them. That's the starting six plus two. Right. No, so. I, I, I get you, but it's like it's, it's just the player minis versus the uh, everything. <laughs> yeah. But then again, it's also Fantasy Flight, and that's why. Yeah. Okay. If we're talking about bank for a buck, a hundred bucks for Gloomhaven versus 80 bucks plus, I don't know how much it is for the expansions. Mansion of Madness is, is $100 retail. Gloomhaven is 140 retail. I take that's that back. Per paper. Uh, mind you, that's MSRP. I have uh, uh, right. played Gloomhaven because I kickstarted it. It was only a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, you got a really good deal. And, okay, and so he's a play and arm production. We say Mansions of Madness. Yep. Replay value. Gloomhaven. I agree. Although. No, I agree because the the app allows you to get extra expansions, but that's the only one I could see it actually winning. Let's just think about it. Yeah, there is more expansion. Well, there are actually real expansions for Mansion Madness. There are more actual ones. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the same number of plays, probably the same number of time for experience. So that's, that's meaningfully a wash. I mean, I, I don't think there's a difference between that, really. Um, and then what's the other one in there? Uh, Minimum number of plays to get the full experience. That's Bloomhaven. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, absolutely, that's what we have. So I would say that's a wash. Okay, wash it is. Uh-huh. Uh, game immersion. But Ooh. first off, let's go meaningful choice. Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven. Yeah. Okay, so now that that's done, let's talk about game immersion. <laughs> that's tough, because they're both very immersive games. They are. They, they have an overarching story. They, well, yes and no. Mansions of Madness has a campaign, but they're sort of it's just little stories in the hp lovecraft something you do in the first game doesn't carry really over to the second game in fact you're probably using different uh and trust me i played a few of these to know that they don't carry over because what we did in the first game which was that exploring that mansion didn't carry over to the next game because they're more of scenario base where mm -hmm. This character does this, this character does this over here. Because one was like, hey, kill everything or stop this thing from happening. And the other one was run away from everything or else you're going to die. So with which different one, characters. Which one is the theme matches the mechanisms more? Probably Gloomhaven because you get more. Because you get to carry your characters over. You get to upgrade those characters. Yeah. Okay, I'll give it that. Player and interaction. That. That's gonna be a wash. That's They're, gonna be a wash. They really do that well, both. Yeah. Memorable moments. Me personally, and this is one of the biased ones, it's Clue Haven. Yeah, you I, I mean, we're talking about Jaws of Lion, but you remember when you played it with uh your son and he Leroy and Jake into the room. That's a memorable moment. You remember when we played it together, um, and your your our mutual friend was trying to make sure they could try to win it. You didn't end up winning it. Because of things, mind you, everybody loses it. There's just more stand-up moments. I've played through ten, and just in the base one, and I can say about seven times, I almost jumped out of the off the chair because certain things happen. Now, how many scenarios have you played in Mansion of Madness? Four, I want to say. Okay. How many stand-up moments do you think there was? I do remember the like the second scenario, and the, there's some really. Crazy. Yeah, the second scenario, there was some really good stuff there. And then the first scenario, uh, when you're trying to figure out to get the right stuff in there to defeat the thing that came out of the thing. I don't right. want to get into spoilers. But for me, I just seen more with Gloomhaven than Mansions of Madness. Yeah. Mind you, I've played probably both of these games more than you have. But whoa, whoa. You're assuming that, sir. You're not wrong. I'm just saying. You're <laughs> that. 
So, anyway. but I have seen Mansions of Madness played more than you played it. How about yeah, that? but that's not saying anything because you worked you worked at the shop. Yeah, <laughs> so, and I demoed it, and they have a demo copy there. You don't yeah. have a demo copy of Gloomhaven. Yes. Do you want to donate yeah. yours when you're done with it? <laughs> no. Ooh, that was blasphemy, wasn't it? No, I, 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 I don't disagree with that. What is the other category in that one, though? Uh, uh, player like interaction. Was, player in action, yeah. Okay. And we then, said that was a wash, so. Then it goes to Gloomhaven. So it's 2-2 two, two with two, one two wash. With a wash, so. Fan vote. fan vote. This is actually quite interesting. It goes into the fan vote. Yep. And tied for last place, Mansions of Madness. <laughs> It Ooh. literally, we're lucky it didn't go to a tiebreaker with Horrified because they both had four votes. Right. <laughs> no, I think we would have just had to just like throw our straight up personal <laughs> bias into it and pick Horrified then. <laughs> yeah. So cool. our champions of champions, our first overall, our first year overall champion is Gloomhaven. And it's not really that surprising. No, no, we can't. I, as soon as I see a, saw Gloomhaven versus Mansion of Madness going into the finals, we had to give it its time. But yeah, it was we. I think you and I both kind of saw that coming. Yeah, well, there's a reason why it's number one. Yes, again, it's not voted on all that much, but everybody loves it. For me, Gloomhaven is a ten out of ten. I really get into it, and if you played the campaign, I think you would too. Because when, when I finally finish the campaign <laughs> and I play past you, then I'll let you know how how wrong you are. The thing about Gloomhaven, what I what really drags it out for me or makes it my favorite game, mm -hmm. is it mitigates luck as much as possible. Yes, you have those cards, but you're not beholden to dice rolls. It gives you that dungeon crawl feel with that Euro puzzle that a lot of people like. And it, this is why I consider myself a Euro trash player. Gives me that theme with Euro mechanisms with a lot going on in a story. So far from what I've seen of the story, it's a really good story, but I haven't got that far in. And if we're talking Jaws of the Lion, which is a prequel, that was a great story. I enjoyed the mess out of that one. It looks really fun. How did it end? I'm not going to get into spoilers here. So I have a quick question for you before we end this. What's Since that? Gloomhaven is our first year overall champion, is it one of the games that becomes vetoed when we talk about our second year top eight debates? You might have to. I agree. It's won four times. It won our first overall champion. This way, we can get new games in that we want to. I agree. And so when when it's reached that level, it has ascended, it has become a champion, and only then will we debate it once more time on next year's champions, and it'll be versus the winner of that. I agree. That would be great. And so, so for future reference, before we go on to top eight debate, there's two things we're implementing in the top eight debate. Well, a couple of things we're implementing in the top eight debate. One, veto power. If there's certain games that we do not want to discuss, we're allowed to eliminate it. We haven't narrowed down how many vetoes we get per debate, maybe one, but we're giving each other the debate. Second, Gloomhaven can no longer be part of the debate. It won. It's moved on. Let's yep. leave it as that. It Here's my question to you. He's our first champion. Jaws of the Lion, yes or no? For what? Yeah. If if it comes up, is it allowed in? Because uh, it's number it's rated six on BGG. Last time I checked, I could be high. It is effectively a sequel. It's actually a prequel. So the question is: if we if we ban pandemic legacy season one, would you allow season two? Yes, if I played it, because I heard they do change some stuff. The thing is, with Gloomhaven Jaws Alliance, it mm, fixed some stuff and made it simpler, but it didn't really change a lot. Just the story's different. Yeah. And of course, you'd expect the story different. It's a different story. Now, about Frosthaven, I don't know. It's not out yet. There are some stuff from what I'm seeing could be different, so that could get into the top eight debate. Maybe. We'll see. But that's something we're going to have to talk about outside. But so just know from now on in the top eight debate, we are going to allow vetoes, one of us each. Right now, I'm going to say one game. We can change that as we go along, and we'll explain to you how that is, as well as Gloomhaven is now out. So long, Gloomhaven. 
It's been, been nice to argue for a year, but we need some change. <laughs> right. Exactly. You've done you've done us well. Uh, maybe pandemic will come back and try and fight you another time. But, <laughs> another time. Yeah. You know, pandemic is three and zero against Gloomhaven. That well, zero. Oh, uh, let me let me see here. Uh, uh, yeah, three and zero now because it lost in campaign in series. Zero and three. Oh yeah, sorry, three zero and three to Gloomhaven. <laughs> it's three and zero to Gloomhaven for losing. <laughs> The only one that Gloomhaven won that it didn't face Pandemic Legacy Season 1 was uh, crowdfunded. Right. Yeah, because it wasn't crowdfunded. That makes sense. Oh, so, goodness. With that being said, you got anything to add? No, this has been a fantastic year. Congratulations to Isaac Childress making Gloomhaven, getting to the top of Board Game Geek, and winning pretty much every argument that we've ever had to debate. So glad to not talk about it anymore, no matter how much I enjoy playing it. So, and actually, my favorite helpful. game, and the only time you're ever going to hear me bring it up again uh, in this aspect, you probably won't even hear it on the top eight debate because I'm not even going to mention it in audible mentions. You may hear it on Chits and Giggles if I start playing the uh, actual game again. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Well, good job. So we want to thank you so much for tuning in to twitch.tv slash everyday board games and joining us live as we do our live debates. And as always, you can find the video re-uploads of this on YouTube at Everyday Board Games 2020. If you like what you see, uh, give us a like and a subscribe because it helps us grow immensely on the platform. As well as all audio versions found on most podcast platforms under Everyday Board Games Podcast. This includes Spotify, Google, Amazon Music, and Podbean. And if you ever want to contact us and say hi or even give us ideas for future episodes, you sure can. Email us at everydayboardgames2020 at gmail.com. As well as you can find us on the official Twitter account of Everyday Board Games under at EBG Podcast. This has been a heck of a year. And we want oh, to thank every, all of our listeners for tuning in. As always, I've been Daniel. And I've been Daniel. And thank you for listening to Everyday Board Games. Have a good one.